we are going to start. So this is one of the first sessions for the Siapumelela Partner Institutions. Uh, today we are going to start off with duty. They're going to be giving us in terms of their progress, what is it that they are doing in terms of the Siapumelela Initiative. And then after that, we will have uh, Nelson Mandela University that will be joining us on stage and then they'll also be sharing the same. Uh, the the title of DOT's presentation is Ubuntu, I am because of others. They'll be looking at food security interventions at DUT. Uh, over to you, Delicia. Thank you very much for being at our presentation this morning. Um, as mentioned earlier, our title is Ubuntu, I am because of others. I have on the stage with me my colleagues who will be co-presenting this morning and they will introduce themselves when they come up to uh, present. But I would like to just highlight that we have two students um, that are presenting and that we have someone who works very closely with students uh, as a residence advisor that is also presenting. So I am part of the core team of Sia Pumalela at DUT. I'm Delicia Tim. And Part of the work that I do is looking also at curriculum work around general education inclusion uh, into our curriculum and part of the aims of our general education component of our curricula is to look at active and critical citizenship uh, for our students and see how we can promote uh, through curriculum efforts um, our students achieving uh, the competencies for engaged and critical citizenship. I also want to say that part of our presentation is also focusing on Professor Guela spoke yesterday about graduate attributes and, and when you look at one of our graduate attributes for our students to be culturally, socially and environmentally aware is amongst some of our graduate attributes and therefore the issue of food security and the basic needs we feel is something that is closely and linked to the graduate attributes. So to start off I'd like to just start off with a, a video clip for us. Many people regard you as a personification of Ubuntu. What do you understand Ubuntu to be? In the old days, when we were young, <clears throat> a traveler through a country would stop at a village <clears throat> and uh, he didn't have to ask for food or for water. Once he stops, the people give him food, entertain him. That is one aspect of Ubuntu, but it will have various aspects. Ubuntu does not mean that people should not enrich themselves. The question therefore is, are you going to do so in order to enable the community around you uh, to be able to improve? These are the important things in life. And if one can do that, we have done something very important which will be appreciated. So we feel that that video speaks quite loudly to some of the issues that we are dealing with in our campus around food security and and for us, with remembering Mandela this year, 100 years of Mandela's birth, we just thought that going back to the legend and seeing what is it that we can associate ourselves with, with the legend in terms of what he said and his life that he led. And therefore, for us, the issue of food security and its link to academic success was something we thought we needed to be looking at. Oh, sorry. So again, I draw also on Desmond Tutu, a person is a person through others. As you will read that quote from him, we see there that there is a need for us to be together, to be collaborative, to work, 
together um, to ensure that we have a stable community life. So drawing on these uh, quotes from Desmond Tutu and, and looking at Nelson Mandela, we decided that we needed to just focus a bit, as I said earlier, on food security. We recognize also that from yesterday's presentation that food insecurity is, is not only a national issue at South Africa, and there is much reading, there's much work. We heard yesterday about Free State University. We know UKZN has done quite a few studies. We, there's been a lot that has been done, and all we're doing today is just sharing with you a snapshot of DUT and where we are at. And maybe we're at the back of the line, or if there's a race of some sort, although I don't think there's a race, but maybe we're just calling out today for people to hold our hands and to walk with us together so that nationally we can start looking at this issue. So if we look at DUT in terms of our own particular context, um, our keynote speaker spoke earlier this morning about how the media sometimes um, tells a different story from what's actually happening in various institutions. But for this case, we looked at the media clips in the period March to April this year. DUT lectures suspended after clash over meal vouchers. DUTSRC one test period postponed due to unpaid allowances. If you look at these kind of newspaper headlines and what is actually happening on the ground, the fact that our students are hungry. One of our lecturers, uh, when I was chatting to them, said that there were some students that weren't coming to her class. And she approached them and said, you haven't been to my class. What is actually happening? Why don't you come? The class, I might add, is 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And she said, why don't you come at that time to my class? And the student said to her, you know, ma'am, where our class is, it's above the cafeteria that fries those lovely maguinhas. Now, for the South Africans, you know what a maguinha is. And when you fry it, you know that smell that you get from frying a maguinha. It's a fat cook. It's kind of a fat cake made with yeast. And, and it's quite popular with the students. And he said, ma'am, to come to my lecture, I have to walk past that, bed, that cafeteria. And when I sit in our lecture room, I get that smell of the fat cook. And I haven't eaten for the whole day. And really, I came for the first week or two, and I couldn't after that because I just couldn't sit in the lecture and know that I haven't eaten and have the smell haunt me. So therefore, I, I found it very, very difficult. So we found that our students, there's many other such cases that we will be following up with at DUT in actually. And then what happened to that student, we then send them to the student counseling and I'll talk a little bit about the project that student counseling is working around food insecurity. So indeed, food insecurity affects our students' academic success. To postpone a test period, you know what it's like and, and, and how the students are. Actually, just last week, the SBUC still hadn't come. And the students still were sitting there and saying, we haven't eaten, we don't have money. And the university has actually come in now to actually say, okay, we will lend, we will give you a loan of some money. And, and, but we're not going to loan you too much money because we don't want you to get into debt. And when your money comes, we will try and, and, and work something out. So this is really for us, I think it's a huge issue in terms of academic success. So what is the data then that we have regarding some food security? This is some just, again, just a snippet. What is some of our NISFAS data? 40% of our students' population is on NISFAS at the moment. And they range from getting tuition fees paid to getting the full package, which includes the meals and the meal vouchers and, and where they're at. So 40%. The 60%, that missing middle again, they might be very large, doesn't mean that they are coping, but we're just using the NISFAS again as an indicator. Student counseling data, um, the student counseling department, as I said earlier, they have some data that they've collected. They have uh, joined up with the alumni department to get some funding secured for students. And so the student counseling role is also to find out and to inquire from the students what is their, their whole uh, socio-economic position. It's not only about the food, but what we've realized is issues of accommodation and there's issues even up to mental health issues that the students are also grappling with. So the student counseling is playing a key role. Unfortunately today they're not part of our panel, but I'm sure later we will start bringing them on board more. In 2016 we engaged in the South African Survey of Student Engagement. We found 80% first generation. We found we had underserved students from under-resourced communities. And 
We also got some statistics I will share later with you of how they spend their money. We also went around speaking to students' experiences, their values, beliefs, but also to staff who are engaging with students to get some data. I'm not going to share all the data today. We're going to uh, have students share some of their experience, and I'll share a bit of the student counselling and SASE data. The student counselling data, I'm sorry you might not be able to read it from the back, but again, it's, it's some very worrying data that has been presented because in 2018, we really thought the problem was bigger. But according to the student counseling data, they said only 29 students had applied for the funding. And we said, but how can that be true when we know the students aren't actually um, eating and there is no food? And, and what we realized there was that there's a communication gap. Students actually don't know where to go and who to go to. But we also found that there are application forms that are in the student counselling. Um, uh, so the student comes to the student counsellor, goes through a, a, a process where they are screened, where they're approved, declined, and, and then they are sent through to the student housing. So with all those different stops, we also think that maybe there's some students get lost along the way. They don't actually end up at student housing where this data was actually recorded. All right, I'll go quickly on. What are students spending? Our SASE student engagement. Students are spending, we can see from our graphs, we can see that on food, we see that um, the food need, which is the extreme uh, left, and then the second last uh, bar is your academic necessities. We can see the students are spending quite high. I think yesterday we saw the graph as well from UFS and the national level. But we can see here that our students are spending, needing to spend much on food. And when we look at the amounts, we see that it's, um, it's in the reddish orange band that's quite high. And that is about 500 to 1,500, which the NISFAS gives 1,000, about 1,100 to 1,500 and a month for students to spend on food. So that's just what we're looking at. Another important point from this graph is that caring for dependents, there's quite a high incident there, you see, of caring for dependents of our students where they need to spend their money. So this was a profile 2016. We are going to be engaging this year in the 2018 survey and we would like to see then how things compare as we go along. So who are some of our partners? We decided we speak in Ubuntu, some of the partners that are in and today we've identified three partners for our presentation, students and academics in, in coursework. Student Counseling, the alumni office, I spoke, as I said, very uh, briefly about them. They formed a food security committee as well in 2017. And that food security committee consists of academics. You heard yesterday about our data Jedis. They're part of that security committee. There's academics, there's people from across the campus, from student housing, from student affairs, um, and, and alumni and student counseling. So it's again, it's quite a, a broad group of people that are starting to look at how they can deal with various issues around um, food security. And then we have Peace Oasis International. So at this point, I'd like to hand over to our next speaker. I think the most scary moment, ladies and gentlemen, is to walk in this room and notice everybody they are looking at me as if, what this gentleman is he doing here? Is he not supposed to be at the back of house preparing us food? Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, I like my chef uniform because it reminds me of how important is the selection of food. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Tim, I greet you all. My name is Boniso Ngobo. I'm from a very small, um, a very small town called Escorts. And there's nothing much uh, to tell about Escorts. It's just that it's small. <laughs> and also, I am the first um, generation to come into university or to have an opportunity to be at university. And I am a part of Deben University in the Department of Food and Nutrition. I, am, I, I happen to be put under an extended curriculum program, and now I'm doing my final year. 
I'm also an NSFAS funded student who also happened to be struggling with um, food allowance to come through up to, to this day. The, then um, I'm also a part of uh, 59 students who are registered for a, a nutrition as a module and um, in, in this module, we, we do a service learning where we, whereby we engage community and also we cover these topic, community nutrition, nutrition education, and food security intervention. Ladies and gentlemen, this morning, we have only one question to answer. And that question is, what the, the, the diploma reveals about the student nutrition? In order to answer that question, ladies and gentlemen, we first need to ask ourselves, what is food security? Anyway, we really, really, really have to ask ourselves that question. Because what I have noticed in most of our discussion, we always focus only on two uh, aspects, which is food availability and food access. But food uh, food security, it is when people has, have an, av an availability and adequate access at all time to sufficient food, safe food, nutritious food to maintain their health and active life. And that is what we need for students. It's, it's an active life and healthy and healthy uh, and healthy life. And these are three aspects that we need to focus on. It's um, food availability, food access, and food utilization. When we talk of food utilization, ladies and gentlemen, we refer to uh, food selection or food knowledge. In order for us also to understand what is food selection, or in order for us to understand how the department came into this kind of initiative or these projects, we need to also, um, I need to, to give you an example of a project, of some sort of a survey we conducted in class. So in my class, this is what we, we did. We conducted a survey and the aim of that survey was to, um, to determine a relationship between dietary uh, quality and nutritional status, nutritional knowledge of the UT nutrition uh, student who happened to be doing a, th a third year at that time. And the other idea was also to gain some sort of an awareness of challenges facing these students. And the aim was to develop strategies that could be implemented to bring about behavioral change in terms of their eating pattern and their lifestyle. <clears throat> and also in order to prevent an ongoing set of a non-communicable diseases and the negative impact food initiative a food insecurity may have to occur to an, an academical outcome. So, ladies and gentlemen, in order also to able to reach our goal was to also to create some sort of an objective, and the objectives was to determine um, the student BMI and was also uh, to also find um, to determine the food variety and the diversity. Of, um, that means I'm we are referring to some sort of selection of food, how the students select food. And also we had to determine their nutritional uh, knowledge and also to establish their social demographic. And when we are conducting this survey, ladies and gentlemen, in class, we're doing this in class, we notice uh, um, these couple of things. One, it was that, uh, some of the students were normal, but most of the students were either underweight or overweight. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm talking about a food and nutrition student here. They are not supposed to be underweight or overweight. They are supposed to be normal. 
then then we then if we, when we found out that results or the findings then we ask ourselves what could be uh, um, in order to you know to give a, a reason what could be the, the the reason the student were underweight we then went on looking again on their 24 hours on their 24 hours daily recall of um, of food and we also look at their uh, some sort of uh, their food um, variety and diversity how they select food and also we focus on their socio demographic uh, profile and that help us to tell us that these three things or their the food security it is it is happen to be influenced or i can say their health and their health is happened to be influenced by the food quality and the price of the food that is available and also the um and also the availability of money so that also tells us that because students don't have enough money they ended up buying the food that they can afford such as the, the example that Dr. Tim has given us, buying a uh, fed cook, the fed cook which happens to be high in, pro in, in, in carbohydrates and also high in fats, but they have literally nutri uh, nutrients. In other words, that's what makes them uh, at, at some point to, have, uh, to, to gain weight and also to be lazy, as to be always tired, to all, they always not alert in class. And that, ladies and gentlemen, it affects their academical outcome. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I'm a very short person, so I'm gonna be very short too. Uh, <laughs> greetings to everyone. Uh, my name is Carol Mguni. I live in Overport. I'm a DUT student, food and nutrition student. I'm currently doing my final year. And I'm, a, I'm part of the mainstream program, which is a three-year program. And I'm also an NSFAS funded student. So as Bonisa said, most of the students are underweight. And I was underweight when I was uh, in first year. And then with the knowledge that I gained, I am currently normal and a healthy eater. <laughs> Um, so I am gonna be telling you guys. Sorry, I am gonna be telling. <laughs> I am gonna be telling you about the food security intervention that we took part uh, at at the clinic at the Isolempilo Clinic, a clinic that is based in Steve Biko campus. Um, so we went there to determine the vital signs of students, of which was to determine their body body mass index. And when we got there, um, the result, I, I was happy with the result, but at the same time, I wasn't that happy. I was happy because I saw that most of the students were normal weight. But then being happy, I also started thinking that yes, they are normal weight, but are they eating the correct food? Are those food gonna help them in the future? And what I thought, and then what I, the conclusion that I came with was that no, the answer was no. The foods that they were eating will affect them at the later stage. They will suffer from many other diseases. So that, so then when I saw that, I decided that in, in our next visit to the clinic, I informed them about the healthy choices that they can take, the food that they can, they can eat. Rather, like for instance, I know a fat cook costs five rand, but in that fat cook, they, we buy, as students, we buy a fat cook that costs five rand, we buy cheese that costs two rand, and we buy poloni that costs one rand. Therefore, they could substitute and buy a loaf of bread, which can cost, which will last them for at least three or four days. And then they can buy cheese and then put, and buy tomatoes instead of buying that. And that's a healthier option, I think, and it's cheap. And then when I continued studying the, 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 the survey that we took, I saw that most of the students were also obese. 
of which could affect them at the later stage because they they will they could suffer from um, lifestyle diseases such as diabetes and cardiovascular diseases, which could cause them not to to complete their degrees or their diplomas, which was very concerning. So then I thought of re uh, recommendations that we can partake in, and one of them being at at DUT we have um, a restaurant called Rendezvous, which. Uh, we cater for the food and nutrition students and it's a it is fairly a cheap restaurant if i could say it's it's, it's very cheap because a plate that has um mash beef vegetables and a gravy cost about 35 rand of which every student that is funded by nsfas receives 80 rand a day to buy a meal and then i thought that if we could raise awarenesses in campus for at least uh, for two, two, two awarenesses a year. That could make a difference in students. Students would want to know more. They would want to know where we are, where we're based, and help them out. And then uh, the, the other recommendations that I came with is was that um, we teach students how to budget, and we teach students how to prioritize. That could be done in orientation days when they are first years, or there could be a program and some sort that could teach, teach students on how to do that. And the final recommendation that I have, of which we, we are about to start, is that us food and nutrition students could collaborate with student res, uh, with residents, student residents with RAs, and uh, go, go around in residence informing students on how to, to choose healthier and wiser options and how to, how to buy cheaper healthier food which it is possible because if you if if you think about the foods that we eat like a student can get eight around and they go to mcdonald okay i'm guilty but <laughs> but 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 if you think about it okay if you have mcdonald probably if you pr com um prioritize probably or like buy a mcdonald today and then get a, a cheaper uh, a healthier option the next day and then you end up getting into the track of eating correct food and you end up liking the the foods that you're supposed to be eating. Thank you. My name is Deliwe Kamane, born and bred in the dusty street of Umzimkolo. I am finance person by profession, a residence advisor, house mother, and a servant at the Peace, Peace Oasis International by calling. Today I'm going to be talking about what is Peace Oasis International doing in DUT in trying to assist or in trying to resolve this issue of the hunger and food security. What is Peace Oasis International? POI is fully called as Peace Oasis International coming out of a peace building program in DUT it is a stand-alone NPO registered under the Department of Social Development. Its vision it is to create communities that are peaceful and united. Then the question is, if we're having this dilemma of food hunger within our students, are our communities within our universities, are they peaceful? Are they united? And what is it? that we are doing or we are going to do or we must do to make sure that there is peace and there is unity within our communities. Just to give you a background of what the organization is doing, uh, we do medi med med mediation and conflict resolution, peace building, causes, and also the Stop uh, Hunger program, which was recently launched on the 5th of May uh, in partnership with Walsingham residents, that is their residence that I am the house mother for, that has got 108 girls residing in it. And then in Walsingham, what we have done now as a mother, before others come, come on to board, I decided that this year none of my students will go to class hungry. This is now the residents making a decision to say here are these 108 girls, I've seen in the past years, students are hungry. And making an example about myself, at some point when I was still a student, 
I had a cup of rice, two potatoes, and one egg. I remember it was Thursday, the following day I was going to write exams. I had to make a decision whether I cook today and eat today or I cook today and eat tomorrow after the paper, taking into consideration that we are going on a weekend, which is Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So I don't know what's going to be happening. The decision that I made was to cook on Thursday, not eat, study with an empty stomach, go and write a paper, two to five, come back and have that little food. And then the rest is history. So I said myself, having experienced such, it will be unfair when you talk about the spirit of Ubuntu if I may not take up and do something. Hence, I came up with the Help a Sister Build a Nation. This initiative, obviously, I've said, is from my residence, which is Walsingham. What do we do in here? We are teaching our students to care for each other. The spirit of Ubuntu, the spirit of sharing, the spirit of unity. So there are those students that are self payers There are those students that are coming from um, privileged backgrounds. So what we do, we donate, myself and them, we donate uh, food stuff, canned fish, canned uh, beans and sanitary towels for those that cannot afford. And then we've got a small garden where we grow our spinach, our carrot, to assist our students. And we are working together with um, another organization called Green Campus Initiative. Here is our little garden. We call this garden a garden of grace. As you can see, 108, how many people are going to, to be served from this little garden? But it is better than nothing. I think the issue of land is coming here. <laughs> but I'm not going to talk about that. I'm not going to talk about that because you can imagine if we've got enough space within our residences, if we're already started. We are not saying we need assistance, but also as students and staff, we have embarked in, in, a, in, a, in a way to try and solve this. These, we've got students came to us now as peace oasis. As you can see, that it was me and my students in the residence. Thanks to Peace Oasis International, who came on board with their program, Stop the Hunger program. To say, anyway, yes, there's something that we have done, but is it enough? Remember, with this garden, and these beans and whatever. Where, where is the mini milk going to come from? Where is the rice going to come from? The cooking oil and other stuff. So Peace Oasis International came to partner with us to try and solve this. So the students themselves, they gave us a list of the things that they would like. I don't know when it comes to nutrition because <laughs> I'm coming from a, a deep rural area, right? There is no carrot, there is no uh, uh, cauliflower and all those things. So when I'm hungry, the only thing that I know is uputu netie. That means mini meal and tea. My stomach is full. I go to class. Now you are coming for the nutrition. I'm already hungry. Now you are giving me carrot. Eh, I don't know. <laughs> it's a long way to go, but I suppose we will reach there. So the students gave us a list. Those are the items that they've given us. So we are currently using a food pantry model. How does it work? We keep food in our residence, in my space as the residence advisor, and also we keep food in Peace Oasis International Pantry because whenever we are short of food, they come and deliver food to us. And then... As I've said that we are currently using the Panda model, as we get more funding, we'll be moving to using the food vouchers that will be redeemable at uh, retail um, stores, whereby students will just go, they will just submit the list of the students that we are serving, and then they will just be uh, ticking the items that, okay, so anyway, has came, and I think that one is, is also going to protect the, the issue of um, the stigma. To say, if you go to ShopRite, everyone will go to ShopRite. No one is going to know. There won't be a, a specific shelf for those uh, students that are at disadvantage. So that one is going to assist us a lot. And what have we achieved as Peace Oasis International? One, we have achieved by giving hope to our students. To say, now, now that I was um, worried, what's going to happen to me? I remember one student came to me and said, Ma, I've got NSFAS, but the only funding that I've got, it is only for two, for for 
for, for, for the, the fees just for me to study. Now, I don't have money uh, for food. So now I might end up having to deregister because I cannot continue to study while hungry. Food, we've given students hope to say, you do the business of studying. We, as Peace Oasis International, working with other stakeholders, we're going to deal with this issue of uh, the, the, the food. So far from March, we have assisted more than 100 students that are staying in res and are staying uh, 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 non-resident students. And, and for me, working in res, I thought it was only my 108 girls. Thanks to Peace Oasis International, who came now as a pro as I'm acting as a project manager, I'm now exposed to the non-resident students that are also suffering. And now it makes sense because I myself was not staying in res at that time when I had one uh, cup of, um, of rice. So gradually the numbers are increasing as we have not received experts. I'm sure you've heard Dr. Tim talking about that. I did mention yesterday when I was making a comment that before I came in here, Last week, Thursday, I had to go and make sure that my student does have food because this week I'm not around and they've started their writing exams this week. As I'm here, students are studying, students are writing, students does have food from Peace Oasis for them to be able to continue their, their, student, their studies. We've already start, uh, assisted first years and second years. We have given them an opportunity to make a better choice, to say, Make sure that whatever that you came in the institution for, you get it by the end of the day. Our partner contribution, we've got a, we are a partner with DUT since we've got an MOU with them. And also for this a project, Stop the Hunger, we are partnered with various faculties and departments that share the same vision with us. And also other partners, it's Woolworths, it's I, ICC, it's a bullet funeral, funeral parlor, and those partners, they contribute cash and kind. Now we talk about the issue of sustainability within the project. The key issue is funding as we depend on donations. However, our partners, our benefactors, and even the members of the organization as individuals, they contribute to say, even if at this point we don't have any monies to give to our students, but the students, we must make sure that the students do have something to eat. We strongly believe in the spirit of Ubuntu. We are saying Ubuntu, Ngumuntu, Ngabantu. I am because you are Izanda Ziakezan. Looking at myself today, as I'm sitting here now working, if no one stood up, and assisted me, I'm sure I was not going to be here. And I'm sure I was not going to have a heart to mother other students. So it was because of Umuntu who assisted me today to stand for Abanye Abandu. This is just a picture of our launch that took place on the 5th of May. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. Thank you very much to our, uh, my co-presenters. So going forward for DUT, I think what's critical for us, what we've discovered is that there are silos, there's things that are happening, but they are very much silos. And part of us engaging in this process, we recognize that we needed to build bridges, bridges within DUT and bridges across even institutions that are doing work out there. And for me, I think that is critical for us as, as an institution is to be part of that bridge building and networking um, in, in, in ensuring food security for our students. We also have a, a institutional researcher and we're looking at the food security and looking at the needs of accommodation associated with that. One of the requests from our SRC that came about in our conversations with them was definitely that they're going to be assisting and working on looking at the quality of food that's available by our various vendors on campus. And besides quality, even looking at things like cost. And then for me, I think one of the things we need to be looking at as part of maybe this part of Sia Pumalela is looking at national collaborative projects and really start looking at each institution's doing their own thing. And if we start having more collaboration together at institutions and start working together, we could even maybe start looking again. I know some institutions do get um, assistance from some of the multinational companies, but maybe we can start looking at it as a, as a broader um, benefit for the institutions. 
We need to maybe also start understanding things like generational poverty and looking at dignity and human rights if we're starting to talk about food security issues on campus. And I want to end by, again, with a quote by Desmond Tutu. If we are neutral in situations of injustice, we have chosen the side of the oppressor. And if an elephant has its foot on the tail of a mouse, you say that you are neutral, the mouse will not appreciate your neutrality. Thank you very much.